Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to Agile 2019 here in the Leading Agile booth. We're doing interviews all week long with speakers and Agile thought leaders who are here at the conference. So if you can't make it, you get a sense of what's going on. And right now, Troy McGinnis is here. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for inviting Shake me back. Shake hands again. Hey. All right, so now it's time for math. That's why Troy is here. All right, you can all switch off now. <laughs> no, one of the great things about Troy is that he spends a lot of time, you spend a lot of time trying to make math, as you've explained it to me, easier for people that are scared of math. Yes, I, I, I think the way we've taught math in school doesn't do us any favors for getting fans of using math in business. And, and as we try to do it in business, there's lots of things like cost of delay yeah. that for people like me, I love the idea and the concept of it. And every time I try to figure it out, I'm like, oh, God, there's so much math. And, and you can't get people started and you're trying to explain it to your boss and they glaze over. Yeah. But thankfully, and I'm using my phone, even though I'm not supposed to, Troy has a number of tools now available. One of the, you make a lot of stuff for free for people. I make a art form of that, yes. yes. Um, um, and that's sort of a way of giving back and making it easier for, the, easier for the rest of us to do our jobs, understand how to have conversations with leadership, things like that. Yeah, yeah. This, um, Mike Bostock, he's sort of a data hero. He used to do the visualizations for the New York Times. Okay. Um, it's something you should know that while some superheroes wear capes, all heroes use data, and he's one of them. Wow. And he started this site that tried to blend how to integrate graphics and interactive elements into articles. Okay. And he started a site called Observable HQ, which I think you're, okay, you're looking at now. Okay, and that's what I'm looking at now. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, see how I could, I could use that. So I tried to pick some topics which I think are hard to explain but easy to experience and put them in articles. And, and I think that's what okay. you found. Yeah, and there's a number. So this is in the Agile software development section of the tool. And we're going to put the link in the show notes. It won't be up there right now, but we'll add it later on. Um, and there's a number of so the sort of short articles with tools built into them yeah. that help people figure out how to do this stuff. And when I looked at it, it looked like I could do cost of delay without actually figuring out cost of delay. <laughs> it certainly, yeah. I mean, I, I think so. That's a classic so thank lesson. thank you on behalf of people like me. The cost of delay, yeah. I mean, it's... it's Easy, yeah. People think they get it, and then all of a sudden, when you try and apply it in the real world, it it uh, it goes wrong. And I think what this article tries to sort of say is that you just have to be close because the numbers of cost of delay grow so exponentially fast that, you know, even if you just phoned it in and roughly did a napkin calculation, you right. would realize that it's worth dealing with. Okay. Um, and you know, I, and I try and through the article give you a lever to play with system utilization. Okay. So you can see that above 80% utilization, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and the, and the cost of delay numbers go astronomical. So even if you just guess to the nearest sort of $100,000, right. it would give you enough evidence to show your uh, executives that, yeah, it's, you know, we need to reserve some capacity to handle variability, otherwise okay. we pay this huge price. So. We're gonna. I want to back it up a little bit for the folks that don't know what cost of delay is. What is a simple explanation? It's the cost that you're uh, you're losing building something and not something else. Okay. So whenever we choose to do something uh, with our development teams, uh, there'll be a. Um, a set of stuff that we don't have time to do because those resources are otherwise busy. So we need to make sure we understand that because it might be more economical to hire more teams. Okay. And if it's not economical to hire more teams, then we should know that as well because we shouldn't. <laughs> so so if it's a company, it could be a software package or something like that in a person's life. It could be, I'm going to do this job or that job. That's right. What's the cost of not finishing this now as opposed to finishing it later? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, uh, you know, we... we experiences this in real life like uh, in, an, in an ER setting an emergency room setting you know we we take people with heart pain before we take people with um, you know sore fingers yeah and uh, so we know this applies and we're also willing to not to have firefighting and emergency services people on standby sitting idle because we know that we need them to be rapidly deployed when they're necessary. Okay. So we, we have this intuitive understanding of uh, cost of not servicing something first. Okay. But we don't often apply that in our world and it applies equally. And if traditional management was running ER, we'd have to make sure that every ambulance every was and fully 100% all, all the time. time. That's and right. And that means there's going to be a long line of people with heart problems waiting outside yeah. and and options expire. So some of them we won't have to take yeah, care Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And we don't get to charge their insurance, so it has an economic impact. Okay. Um, 
one of the ways that this stuff was explaining about the utilization was you think about a highway mm -hmm. right and we've got cars on it and they're jammed up and the way we tend to approach work is if the highway was going slow we would try to push more cars onto the highway to make it go faster that's but, right but, and that's quite reasonable if every car was automated and drove at exactly the same speed, we could pack that highway to 100% utilization and everything would move at exactly the right moment in time. So it's not just utilization that matters, it's okay. variability that matters. So why, why we have to uh, run highways uh, at the lower congestion and meet at people on the on-ramp is the fact that not every car accelerates at the same time. Some have a, a longer following distance than others. Yeah. Some are sending a text message on their phone so they lose track of the car in front and of them. Some are tailgating and some are tailgating. Space. Some, yeah. So it's that you need utilization and variability to understand how they interact. And that's what I tried to build into these tools. Okay. I tried to show you that if you're in an operation environment and everything is automated, you can run at higher levels of utilization without impact. Okay. But if you're in an innovation setting where there's a lot of unknowns and no one in the world has ever done it before and you're going to find a lot of new stuff, right. you can't run at those high utilizations. So these articles are trying to get people to experience that interplay that, you know, why we, the, the law is stay below 80% utilization will pay a huge price in lead time. That's only true if you have moderate to high variability. Okay. And uh, I, that, that's the type of stuff I'm trying to teach. And, you know, to be honest, so I, I run these workshops on forecasting and metrics, yeah. and I have a set of topics I'm going to cover and a set of optional topics. These are the optional topics that no one ever actually um, chooses, and it drives me insane because <laughs> they're the core information they need to know to make these really smart trade-offs and decisions about team size and so forth. Okay. And they're not getting them. So I'm, so I'm making them free and, and, and having a, a way of people to, people into to understand this stuff. Yeah, the okay. basics behind the folklore. So this 80% thing, so a lot of traditional managers want to know what is the utilization of everyone on the team. I have to make sure they're booked out at 100%. And you're saying, nope, 80%. Well, if they're, I'm assuming 80% if they're only on one thing. Yeah, that's right. If That's how to think of utilization. When people have to task switch, it's because they're over 100% utilized. In other words, we need you to stop working on that and work on this instead. So right. if people have three or four balls in the air at one time, when they're working on the most important one that, that's said now, they're not working on the others and their lead time is, is, is oh, growing. Yeah. And that's, that's all there is to, um, to this prediction. And it's been around before software, um, we'll lining up in it. supermarkets, lining up and getting your license renewed in registration. Okay. Um, if the, there's different cases there. The cost of delay isn't on the licensing authority. It's zero to them. Right. So the there's no incentive for them to, to reduce queue size, which is why often you spend hours getting your driver's license yeah. renewed, right? But if the cost of delay is to you, it is in your interest to scale it back if you're doing highly variable work. Because okay. when people get distracted by other um, other things, they're not working on the most important. So, okay, how do we how do we make them work on the most important? So, if we increase the utilization above eighty percent, that increases the cost of delay. Yes, the cost of delay will grow because the queuing time for each item will grow to very large amounts of time. And we're saying, given that it might cost us $1,000 a, a day of lost revenue by not having this feature in the market, yeah. if it's gonna now take it to 10 days, it's yeah, $10,000. Okay, so you can use, I've, I've heard people explain cost of delay as a way of understanding priority, business priority, right? If it's revenue or something like that. Can you use it to understand how to optimize your utilization? I mean, does it work the other way? Yeah, I think it does. And one of the there's two of those notebooks interactive notebooks one of them is the economic impact of utilization okay and yeah and i get you just to drag the slider above it and you'll see that if you're in a low utilization system that you you don't pay a really high price of cost of delay at all okay um, it's only once you get up uh, into the higher levels and there are two parts to the variability and we focus on one more than another the first one being reducing cycle time you know we try and do everything lean makes an art form of reducing right. the the, um, the increase in the process efficiency decreasing the amount of time works it's idle maximizing the amount of time yeah. work is being hands-on 
But there's another set of variability we ignore, and that's the arrival rate variability. Okay. I mean, that freeway instance, if everyone arrived at one time, Total jam. queue time, you get traffic jam. Even if over 24 hours, that's a relatively low number. Right. So we need to do the same thing in our world, for our software world. We need to control the variability of arrival rates, possibly by adding whip limits or possibly by um, having a prioritization system so that okay. we only take the highest priority items first. And then we also have to look at the lean side and reduce the variability of how long it takes to service an item once we start it. Okay. And I find there's a bit of asymmetry in our industry. We focus more on reducing the time once we've started it. Yeah. So if we were talking about reducing the arrival rate, that just stay with the highway analogy, mm -hmm. the stop lights in certain cities that show like you can only enter when the light's green and one car at a time. That's exactly what it's doing. Because yes. they're trying to limit the frequency or the speed with which new cars are entering the system. They're fixing the arrival rate so there's no variability. Okay. But you're still going to get the backup behind there. This is one of the things about all this stuff that gets my head trapped is I can say, yeah, we're only going to let them into the system so frequently, but I'm still getting a big queue yeah. stacking up outside. Yep. So it, it's just shifting that delay to where I'm not looking at it, right? There is. And you, your goal is to shift the delay to the ones which have the lowest cost of being delayed. Okay. And that's where the cost of delay comes in and prioritization comes in. So yes, if you, you could do all these things and still not deliver the highest value items first right. and fastest. So I, you know, I think we should first focus on if something is super hot critical, yeah. that's the one we want to flow through with the, with the lowest level of impediments and delay. Okay. And the ones which are on the lower priorities that have been deferred, yeah. uh, let's, let's, let, them uh, let them sit. And you know, that's what we do in hospitals all the time. It's what we do in, yeah. in, um, in actually making people wait to board a plane. So if, if we were used, I want to try to tie it back to something people connect to. So if it was Kanban, mm -hmm. we've just got this queue, we handle stuff in the order in which it comes, and we were, we're tracking the flow through the different stages, trying to reduce the cycle time there. So we get faster throughput, doing whatever we can there. But I still have that queue forming, the one I was just talking about, where everything's still in line. I'm gonna, is it okay if I adjust this like that? Okay. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> put it back. Um, so we still have the big long queue, but if I'm using cost of delay, then I'm allowing for reprioritization within the queue, which might not necessarily be normally how people would, would use Kanban. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there was there was an attempt in the early days through class of service on, on Kanban to say that something should be able to jump the queue given the latest information and make the choice of what you pull at the last possible moment so that you can incorporate the latest information in that in that decision. But yeah, it, it has ramification. If you start cherry picking items that you're going to pull through, yeah. you delay others even more than they would have been delayed. So whereas they would have been next in the average, yeah. you, you will drive down the average queue time, but not the individual items queue time. Okay. Some of the, so by being picky, yeah. you will actually cause harm to some others. So I always think of this like a bouncer in a club. Yeah. Right? So if well, everybody just got to go you've in. You've had more experience there. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> of not getting into the club, maybe. Yes. The, the bouncer lets the people in in the order in which they go. But if the bouncer, when it's time to let somebody in, says, okay, you, yeah, not so much with that thing you're wearing. Attractive people, you're coming. Yeah, in, yeah, Because yeah. they want the attractive people. Yes. But we don't know if I've the person. I've not experienced that. The no. person who doesn't get in might have a wallet full of cash and want to spend it all in the club. They hear the Australian accent, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you would be wanting to find a way to understand the value that each thing in the queue can bring. Mm -hmm. And there's a cost of delay. If you've got a heavy drinker and you don't let them in, you're going to lose bar sales. Right. And But somebody could also argue, well, yeah, but look at look at those people. They, they're they hot. We should let them in because more people want to come in. But that just increases the queue anyway. Yes. Okay. Got to be a big... There's, there's no right answer to any of this stuff. There's just balance. Okay. And, you know, you might want to make sure that the club has an equal mix of uh, of male and female or male Ugly male and male. attractive. Yeah, like whatever, whatever. <laughs> Cheap suits people the club. and spenders. Okay. Yeah, right. I mean, because you, so anytime you go to an extreme and you try and overthink this stuff, you will actually cause a system damage somewhere else. So it's not that any one of these systems rules the day. They're mm -hmm. just discussion points. Yeah, discussion points. And I think that if you understand the basic concepts of it, yeah. that high utilization in a highly variable system is going to cause damage. 
that's enough of a point to get to on the math. Okay. And you don't need to go into the raw numbers, which is why I give you sliders rather well, than a rather than a box to type in, because I want you to realize it's rough and ready. And people like to look at stuff. So if I'm I'm using the tools, I can create something graphical. I can show to management to try to help them get their heads around. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk about your workshops too. Oh, okay. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. You want. Uh, <laughs> it's not like we hadn't prepared that or not. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of nowhere. Um, so you're doing these two different workshops, one on uh, outcome-based data. This is so long, Troy. Okay, data-driven <laughs> coaching and forecasting using data. <laughs> I should have left them alone. The titles are long. But I wanted to ask you about, in the, in the data-driven one, you're talking about coaching teams with data insights. Yeah. And I'm curious about that and what kind of data you think people should be looking at when you're coaching teams because uh, it's not just point. velocity it's not it's not and you know i i borrow very heavily from larry macaroni here who's been on the show before yes. and many times so you know, larry two things he's really contributed and one is is the fact that um you've got to have a balance of metrics if you if you're just going to choose something like velocity mm -hmm. then people might be sort of inclined to just do more extra, stuff. Do more stuff yeah. or put higher uh, estimates on them so that they, uh, they appear to be working faster. So you need something to contrast that to see that it, the system's out of balance. So you might want to also track value delivered or quality. Okay. So that if they push any of those metrics too hard, you you will be able to spot that the system has failed somewhere else. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he has sort of... Um, the six I think he uses are you know, um, a measure of how much, um, a measure of how quick, okay. uh, a measure of how consistently you can deliver at that rate, okay. um, a measure of quality. And, you know, I've added two, which I think are important because I think you could do all those and still have a bad environment. I've said value. Okay. that you could do all that, but let's make sure we're delivering value, some measure of value so that we can see that we're not just doing easy stuff of low value, we're sure. actually doing the most stuff that's valuable stuff. to the customer. And some form, and I know it's ironic, I'm saying there's some form of team happiness. And why? Because we need to know that we can continue doing that in the future. If yeah. all the team is about to leave because you're overworking them in crunch mode for weeks and weeks at a time, they're not gonna be able to maintain those metrics. Right. So, you know, I think that coaching teams through Insights is about helping the team to make smart trades between those six areas. Yeah and understand that you can't be good at all of them and you shouldn't be, context should matter. Okay. Your ops teams, you want to be super responsive. Your final team doing UI, you want to be super high quality because right. they're the last gate before the customer, right? So there's no one formula for perfect team metric success here. And I know people are looking for one. Okay. And I want them to start thinking about um, having the challenging the team to trade wisely we're super good here, but we want to improve here. How can okay. we give up some speed to spend a bit more time doing testing? Okay. That so sort of stuff. I want to talk about the happiness thing for a second. because I want to tie that, try to tie that back. Because a lot of people, I bring that up in class and I'm like, whatever. I mean, and I've, I used to have that reaction to it too. But yeah. if, if you think about how hard it is to replace, how hard it is to find tra skilled agile people to begin with, how hard it is to replace them. Yeah there's a lot of economic value for the company in tracking happiness or some way of quantifying that. Yeah, some way of quantifying it. I mean, even if we just start looking at the first one about um, are they actually doing work that they still find challenging and want to do? Are they giving the opportunity to grow? To grow? Um, and the classic one I look for is, uh, for instance, in the new hires, are they hiring in on new frameworks and technology without training the internal staff because that's okay. what's happening there is is you the, longer, the, the longer you are at the company the, the more you're not you're not being given a chance to grow and learn new skills yeah um so that how does that turn out now that turns out when you start forecasting future products and portfolios and the fact that they'll have ever declining reason to help other people in the company learn yeah so now you when you want to split a team you don't have an opportunity because you don't have two people who know how I to think. do something, you only have one. And you, so teach the people who work for you new skills and make it contingent on them learning those new skills that they share there, what they currently know with new hires. Okay. Reverse that, reverse that around. And I've seen that as having huge return 
uh, instability over the next you know, which is going to time. increase all the other things anyway which makes all the others go forward so okay. it's not happiness from a perspective of just you know being kind to people although it's a good start um, I think it's um, it's actually important for stabilizing a system maybe they should call it non-misery non-misery <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone called it, uh, I, I, I put stuff out on Twitter all the time and yeah. I called it sort of happiness, but uh, someone said, no, nah, that's the sustainability metric. So, okay, he, um, that's not a bad name for it. I probably should call yeah. it sustainability. Okay. So what about value? So you mentioned that, and this is like one of those questions that I never find has an answer that I'm like, there it is. How do you, how are you talking about measuring value if we're saying we're going to... So it's it certainly... The, Value and quality are the two hardest metrics that you're, you're going to have but to But quality, tackle. you can track bugs or use or... Yeah, but it, quality is, is whether the customers feel that it's actually solving their, uh, solving their job. And I find okay. just the defects are just things that we didn't do right. So That's really interesting, though. Did, I mean, we all think about defects, yeah. but does it actually help the customer do their job? That's right. I mean, it, it could be a... So a a solution which doesn't solve the intended problem it still has a quality problem in my mind. Okay. You remember, we're using these metrics to, to see that they're working in opposition to each other. So if we just do something simple for us with zero defects, right. I, I, but the customer doesn't find it useful in solving the problem that was intended, yeah. then that's not a quality so will we then look at like utility for the customer, yeah. or adoption by the customer, something like that, Usage, as well as defects? The fact that they're using it, um, how many of them actually sort of say that it actually did solve the problem, one to ten? Okay. You know, um, and value itself, I mean, value is a hard one. Start off giving everything equal value and then ask people to find one thing that they think is actually more valuable than another. Okay. Bump so it up. And, and just sort of, you're looking for a separation across three sort of zones. And I do the same thing with cost of delay. I don't do the math on cost of delay. I know that's shocking for everyone, right? I have things that I know we're going to do and everyone just agrees are super hot, urgent, yeah. and expensive not to do. You've got this muddy middle. And then you've got this stuff that we've deferred the last five years and are probably going to defer for the next five yeah. years, right? Delete the ones in the green, the last zone, right? Now, the, what you're worried about in cost of delay is that there's something in that blue zone, yeah. which should be in the first zone, something in that not, muddy middle that's not in the super hot. Right. So if you just get people to think of value, is there's something here in this first third of the- It's not the, sexy, the, but we have to It's have. not sexy that we really need to do, yeah. say it now or wait for the next year. And without cost quarter. of delay, it's just people's gut and bias that's that are making right. those decisions. So then you get them to tell a story as to what, what the delay cost is. And then if you still need more work, now dive into the numbers and get it numerical. Okay. But most of the time, just coming up with the, someone giving the reason why it's a high cost of delay from a customer perspective is enough to say, we agree. Okay. Move it forward. And so to tie this back to the person in the hospital with the, with the hurt finger or the heart issue, if we were just looking at velocity, that would be basically saying, all right, everybody with a hurt finger, off with you. We're not worried about you. Even if that hurt finger is a symptom of yeah. like something critical that they're about to like have a stroke and die. Yeah. And, and so we need those other metrics to get a more holistic understanding of what's actually happening. There, there is. And there's a great, there's actually a, a guide to ER triage okay. that, that, that every hospital uses. So this is a, this is a common document that's been built over many years. And you know, as you're reading through it and they sort of say, this should be a critical, and you're thinking, why is that why a critical? That but you know someone bled out in the waiting room or something like that because there was a, they had a head injury that wasn't evident. Yeah. They said they had a headache and were going to be dismissed, but that could be a sign. Have you fallen recently? Or, you know, I've, I've got flu-like symptoms. Have you been to Africa recently? Yeah. That changes the criticality even though you're... Um, so that's the sort of data we need to get in our world. Maybe it's not numerical. It's maybe, does this impact the customer who's about to sign up for another thousand seats yeah that increases the cost of the delay of that feature even though normally it wouldn't even make the cut but i wonder if we i mean in a hospital people only they're going to be injured but there's only so many ways you can injure the human body and we've probably discovered them all yeah if it, we keep changing still working what we're on new doing ones, well but the symptoms <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Let's see. Um, but but in the, in the business we keep changing what we're doing and how we're doing it and so 
do you think we'll ever be able to get to that where we can say like, well, your team's velocity dropped by 4%. Why did this, did this thing happen also? Did you have a team member join or leave the team? Well, maybe this is what you need to do. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think we'll ever get there. And I don't think we should, right? I mean, that part of being innovative in business is actually being able to um, adapt to these new changing of, of reasons for doing work. Okay. And, you know, express it as cost of delay or just express it as making a strategy. Um, I think that um, we're still inventing new strategies for making money. Okay. And I, so I don't think, that's why I think just roughly ordering them and understanding why some things are super hot and some things are just in that muddy area, yeah. roughly equal. Do those ones in alphabetical order, do them at random. It doesn't matter. In that muddy middle area, there's your guess is as good as mine, Okay. right? But in that upper area, there's a clear reason why we're going to do it. So I'm saying work more on the clear reason of why and less on the math. Okay. So we're still kind of in that agile smells kind of thing, but we want tools to figure out why the smell is bad. Yeah, I think okay. so. Is there anything, this is my last question. Okay. Is there anything that you're looking at now that you're still trying to just get sorted out from a metrics perspective, like any new problem you're wrestling with? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of work recently on, um, on dependencies between teams, how mm -hmm. to understand uh, if we could help one team, which would have the biggest system impact. Oh, wow. So, you know, I, like, just by getting a sample of team, how to hand off to team, how to hand off to team, how to hand off to a team, you know, we can start counting the frequency of how often teams hand off to a certain other team. Yeah. And if we know that team's average lead time, we can now sort of combine frequency with duration to sort of say, and this is the hot spot. Okay. Right. Um, this is the this if, is the problem. If we, yeah. If we could find a way of getting team four to work with team two better. Yeah. That that will improve flow most out of anything. And are you using like Monte Carlo analysis or something like that to figure? No. Out? I mean, I really just take the average and okay. multiply it by the frequency. Okay. And come up with a number and just highlight it from red to red to green. Okay. And, and it tends to stick out. Pretty obviously. Pretty now obviously. is that in here too? That's not in there, but it's okay. in my. We'll put the link to the other stuff I okay. have. Um, well, fo on fo focus objective. Focus objective, okay. yeah. And you've your GitHub. Yeah, my GitHub. Okay. So it's on the GitHub. It's it's all based. On, uh, I started off with Klaus Leopold's flight level model. He has that middle level, which is team to team coordination. But I thought I've been working on that. Like this is the I part where Troy that? talks about stuff you don't understand, and it's okay because he does. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Worry about dependencies. If you don't know what your problem is, if flow in a big company, it's dependencies. Okay. And we need to we need to get serious about fixing it. Okay. Cool. This was great. Thanks for coming by. No, no problems. Enjoy. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. You too. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Oh wait, one one more second. Oh. Focusedobjective.com is Troy's website. Yeah. That's where and, they go to find and there'll be more. links in the comments for the other stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.